At the outset, let me thank uh, Dr. Banshi Sabu for allowing me each year to speak about things that I really like uh, in Diacon. And, and over the years, uh, this has been a consistent uh, topic for me, looking at beta cells, looking at pathophysiologic targets, insulin resistance. And I really appreciate this opportunity that I get. But I do have conflicts of interest uh, that include speaking on an area on various things that may be spoken uh, today in this. Uh, those of you who remember uh, this particular slide uh, from many years ago, uh, when I gave the oration at the RSC, talks about the six ways by which we play with nature. Uh, more food, more frequent food, changing the quality of food, processed food, eating food for entertainment, right? This is the one thing that we do. More light, less sleep, disturb sleep, changes in the circadian rhythm, less physical activity, more sedentary time, sitting is a new smoking, more screen time. Of course, a flat earth where we keep traveling across time zones, stress with no downtime, and of course, less sunlight, more indoor time, more controlled temperatures. We've pretty much done it all in the last 100 years, especially in the last 50 and even more so in the last 20 years. And this has led to many changes in us and has, has increased the risk of diabetes, and obesity, and metabolic disease. Indeed, this particular study, that, uh, the Today study that is published in the NHIM, is the largest therapeutic trial in adolescents with type 2 diabetes, like 500 participants, right? And, and uh, looked at young adults and adolescents. The uh, mean age was 26.4 plus or minus 2.85. And a, a time since diagnosis, which was around 6.3 plus or minus 1.5, eight, eight years. And you will notice uh, as the follow up years increase, you will see that up to 34% of these patients had an A1C of 10. Right? Their baseline prevalence of hypertension was 19.2, and the cumulative incidence over time was around 67. Similarly, up to 54% had a, a, a kidney disease by, by the time that, uh, that, that the study uh, endpoints were met. Uh, a cumulative incidence of dyslipidemia 51.6. A baseline prevalence of dyslipidemia 20. Remember, these were adolescents when they started. And of course, new nerve disease in about 32%. What is clear is that the diabetes related complications appear early and they accumulate rapidly with microvascular complications in 60% of patients. So whatever is happening in diabetes is happening quite early and its memory seems to persist. This sort of uh, tells you how long it takes for people to, do, to develop the first, second and the third complication. Let me go back to an old uh, definition of diabetes. <laughs> and, and this is that diabetes is a disease characterized by failure of glucose homeostatic control. And we should attribute this to Dr. Dr. Uh, uh, Unger a little. And he actually showed, uh, especially with the studies on glucagon, how there is a failure of glucose homeostatic control. And of course, we moved uh, and we understand the causes of hyperglycemia, uh, thanks to Dr. DeFranzo's uh, famous Banting lecture. And we now have added more to this Adding, adding almost up to 13, and, and, and every year we have a catchy uh, 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 caption, uh, the uh, dreaded uh, decad, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the interesting 12, the dirty dozen, you know, a whole bunch of things that people start adding to it. But the truth is all of these cause, are, are causes of hyperglycemia, but they do not really explain why is it that there are complications that are taking place. And why is it that that progression of hyperglycemia is, is causing the problems that diabetics have? The one thing that we know as a common pathway in most patients with diabetes is this, that, that uh, because the uh, organism tries to save uh, adipose tissue, store up uh, in adipose tissue the fatty acids and the fat, the fat being a readily available reserve and storage of uh, of energy 
At some point of time, the adipose site senses something is going wrong. And, and this seems to summarize what we have, that there is an early insulin resistance that takes place inside the adipose tissue. And that causes for uh, uh, MCT1, nothing to do with men, but actually monocyte chemotractin proteins that get attracted into the uh, adipose tissue store uh, compartment, which is the abdomen. And then there's a jugal bandhi of sorts. At, at some point of time, the adipose uh, site actually undergoes apoptosis and the fat becomes systemic. When the fat becomes systemic, there's insulin resistance. And we all know that the consequence of this is uh, ectopic fat deposition, uh, fat deposition in the liver, pancreas, and of course, so a systematization uh, of, of uh, Inflammation. Remember that fatty acids and inflammation go, go hand in hand. And this is an evolutionary conserved uh, mechanism because uh, fatty acid use is associated with inflammation. Uh, and simply because it's a way of, of preserving the brain and, and, and uh, diverting uh, glucose to the brain, diverting the fat to other, other parts of the body. So at this point of time, there is dysregulation of adipocytokines, overproduction of free fatty acids, ectop ectopic uh, lipid accumulation, lipotoxicity, and of course, inflammation of the pancreas. To fast forward this, because I've spoken about this many, many times, uh, let's, let's go back to one of the studies, uh, a bunch of studies that were done in the previous DK. The, the extension of the UKPDS, the proactive study, the advance, the VADT, the accord, and what you will notice that, except in the UK PDS, tight glycemic control was not associated was not associated with any benefit. And that's simply because in the UK PDS, there was uh, the patients who were enrolled had a, a diagnosis that was made less than one year. In all the others, they had diabetes for a long period of time. So clearly, what was being presented from these trials was. That one, that if you want tight glycemic control to prevent complication, you have to uh, start early. But also that there was something happening that was that even if the glucose control was better over a period of time, that people did develop complications as, as, as was shown by your court. Indeed, to take this further, so there seems to be a, a metabolic memory of sorts with that we call legacy effect. But interestingly, not all people uh, who have high glucoses end up developing these complications as the Medivist cohort in the, in the, from Jocelyn showed, these are type 1 diabetic patients. And remember the DCCT was published in 1983 and then since then, uh, these people have had reasonable control, but not all of them developed retinopathy. In fact, there seems to be a correlation between the development of retinopathy and the accumulation of rage. But this is the only thing that has happened. I won't go into each part of this, but, but it looks like we now know what is happening as a, as a sum total. That the genes are not probably generally involved, but, but there are some genetic factors that, that contribute to it. Right? These could be copy number variations, that there could be SNPs, there could be polymorphisms. Then, of course, uh, that the environment contributes it, and the environment works through epigenetic imprinting. It could be histone acetylation, it could be DNA methylation. And the one consistent protein that seems to be involved in all of this is a protein called the thyrotoxin interacting protein called the texnin. When these are present, and four important things seem to happen. One is the glycation end products that we talked about, especially methyl glycoxyl. And then the two other things that we need to know is one is inflammation that we have spoken ad nauseum. And of course, the reactive oxygen species, which is probably a, a direct uh, outcome of mitochondrial dysfunction. When these and the presence of hyperglycemia are present, and if you have the appropriate epigenetic and, and genetic uh, environment, complications occur. This was one of the earliest studies that looked at the progression of metabolic memory. And we know that this is, this is sort of uh, the, located in the mitochondria. One of the things that happens is the respiratory cycle. Uh, it, is, it is responsible for three things, the ATP production, 
apoptosis and, and of course, ROS production. Remember, there is some uh, reactive oxygen species that are present somewhat. But when the electron chain is, is disrupted uh, by mitochondrial dysfunction that occurs in type 2 diabetes due to hyperglycemia, the transfer chain is, does not occur. There, there is a pro, the proton leak is not uh, complete. And what seems to happen is the reactive oxygen species accumulates. And when that happens, a whole bunch of downstream effects, including issues with assembly, issues with other, other things happen, and you have mitochondrial dysfunction. So hypoglycemia induced tissue damage occurs when, when this, this uh, electron chain transfer does not occur correctly, leading to uh, accumulation of reactive oxygen species. To summarize, you have glucose, you have increased uh, in the mitochondria, you increased reactive oxygen species. This can cause changes in the cytoplasm that includes the polyol flux, increase in AGs, uh, inflammation, and, and other things. So the metabolic memory seems to be a vicious cycle that seems to keep occurring uh, continuously after a period while hyperglycemia contributes to it initially. But at some point of time, there is a there is a com continuous cycle. Uh, these in vitro studies have looked at antioxidants and vitamin C as having having to prevent it, but even these don't seem to work after a period of time. To sort of summarize what we know, because I want to do move into the meat of my topic, which is mitochondrial dysfunction and, and modulators. Uh, when you have diabetes, you have hyperglycemia. Uh, ages, uh, you have uh, oxidized lipids, you have cytokines. Three different kinds of signal transactions go haywire. One is mitochondria, you get oxidative stress, and of course, you have ER stress. These become epigenetic modifications that include histone modifications, uh, DNA, uh, and of course, miRNAs. And now we have ink RNAs, they can cause chromatin green. What these do is they upregulate inflammatory fibrotic and cell cycle genes and they lead to, lead to diabetic vascular complications. The metabolic memory uh, law, this thing is also because uh, what happens in hyperglycemia and especially in some people is that, that, that there is metabolic inflexibility. Normally the glucose, uh, the brain is an obligatory use of, the glu use of glucose, somewhat like, like the fetus. But the rest of the body, uh, uh, one of the things that insulin resistance does is it, it actually creates a protective mechanism by which the glucose is, uh, is preferentially used for, the, used for the brain. That's because when you create the degree of insulin resistance, the, the, the mitochondria and most of the other cells switch to fatty acid metabolism and it should do it fairly efficiently. But when this is not brief as in, you know, an acute inflammation, but it is continuous as in chronic inflammation, what really happens is that, that the insulin resistance remains sort of permanent. Fatty acid, while, while very, very good, is not very efficient. And what it does is it sort of causes building up of the uh, of, of, of ROSs. So what do you really have? What really happens is when, when you're fasting, you really want to be using the fat. When, you, when you're feasting, uh, you want to be using up the carbohydrates. But what happens is when you have metabolic inflexibility, which is what is happening, uh, the, the, you're not using the fuels rightfully and, and efficiently. So when you have when you have dysglycemia, you have overloaded free fatty acids. You could have you have, you have mutations, you have mitochondrial problems. Of course, you are aging, you get mitochondrial dysfunction, and that leads to furthering of insulin resistance. Uh, and of course, dysglycemia, hypertension, and the complications. In patients with uh, diabetes, ATP synthesis is, 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 is retarded and decreased in, in the mitochondria, and it contributes to mitochondrial dysfunction. And these are the ways that it can occur in, across the body. It could occur in the nervous system. Uh, it, could, it, could, it, could, it could occur in the, in, in, in the digestive system, in, in the endocrine system, in the musculoskeletal system. There is also a lot of data that is being, that is being uh, looked at, that looks at the role of exocytic vesicles uh, that, that, con that contain these disordered mitochondria that are, being, that are being taken as part of the exocytic cargo, the mitochondrial cargo as we call it, that gets deposited in the endothelium and actually causes damage there. 
In diabetes, there are there is more to it than just the just this. Uh, there can be mtDNA mutations uh, that 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 is that are found in both type one and type two diabetes that can cause the uh, dysfunction. In addition, there is mitochondrial swelling because of accumulation of diacylglycerol, long chain fatty acid, and these activate a protein kinase C that causes insulin resistance. Second and the third is that is not here is of course there can be an issue with the shuttling, especially the citrate shuttling. Then there is disrupted electron uh, potential uh, across, and and what really happens in, is is in the complex in the respiratory chain complexes one, three, and four. There can there can be a disrupted electron potential, and of course there can also be uh, a, a, a change in the proton leak, which is very is, is very key to the function. Then of course there is oxidative stress, where the excess lipid substrates uh, lead to the pressure in the mitochondria, causing what we call the metabolic uh, gridlock. And even if glucose is available in plenty, ATP declines. So to summarize what we know about mitochondrial dysfunction, there are genetic factors which are empty DNA mutations, uh, DNA mutations, NDNA mutations. There can be common genetic variants, and of course these are uh, these are on top of environmental factors. Remember, the genes load the gun, the environment fires it, and this can be happen right from uh, right from before birth, and of course all the other stuff that we do, whether we eat the processed food or increase sugar. Ultimately, the common, the final common pathway of, of all of this is mitochondrial dysfunction that that can cause both beta cell dysfunction in the beta cell, yeah, uh, in, insulin resistance in the other cells, and and this leads to type two diabetes and also its complications. Just to add this little bit, uh, what seems to happen is is, is of course FOXO. Now FOXO is like a, like a beacon in the in the in the cytoplasm. When you have increased, when you have insulin that is sufficient and it's working, FOXO remains uh, phosphorylated and, and remains inside the cytoplasm. But the moment uh, there is excessive glucose, uh, FOXO remains in the, moves to the uh, nucleus. And when you have uh, ER stress, this, this becomes uh, more. What FOXO does is it, it, it actually uh, supports the metabolic flexibility that we talked about. It allows uh, excellent use of the, and this is done through the HNF4, HNF1 alpha, and the PDX uh, proteins, and and they actually cause use of the long chain fatty acids into beta cell oxidation. But at some point of time, when hypoglycemia persists, FOXO disappears, and then the and then really what happens is that uh, the lipid oxidation pathway becomes very very dominant. And and uh, ultimately, uh, this does lead to uh, dysfunction. So, how do we work on this? One, of course, caloric restriction. You eat less. You reduce the nutrient overload. You reduce your uh, ROS. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, there is a, there is only, there is a very uh, less affection of the ATP, and of course, energy uh, uh, expenditure becomes less affected. But clearly, our drugs have not worked sufficiently to address uh, the progression of diabetes. Remember that the drugs that we have, all of them, uh, even the S uh, GLP-1 RAs and the SGLT2 inhibitors, they work on you know some off-target effects. Uh, for example, delivery of fuel, which is a good thing that the SGLT2 inhibitors do. But whether it's metformin or any of the other drugs, they really don't work on the the important part, which is the inflammatory signals working at the level of the mitochondria and clearly that should be the, that is that is where the future of this lies in remember that the metabolic syndrome which is central obesity hypertension insulin dyslipidemia is is a is another side of the cardiorenal syndrome right and and ultimately uh, progression of the metabolic syndrome leads to the cardiorenal syndrome so one of the things that people have talked about is how to interfere with the respiratory, the respiratory chain in the mitochondria, prevent mitochondrial overload, prevent uh, ROS uh, generation. There, there are there are many many uh, examples. People have used enzymes. People have used uh, vitamin C. They've used antioxidants, but none of these have, have proven to be uh, of great help. 
but there are a new group of agents that are being tested out and some of these are are, are being are are seeing early clinical trials that that may actually help that provide efficiency uh, to the mitochondria so so the principle of mitochondrial modulators is that that they correct the metabolic dysfunction that arises due to inappropriate or underutilization of carbohydrates proteins and lipids they correct they directly correct the metabolic reflects in the liver pancreas and skeletal muscles and in contrast the hclt2 inhibitors they directly improve energy efficiency instead of just an off target effect so so clearly what people are talking about is that having different kinds of uh, targets one is looking at insulin secretion that we do with sulfonylureas dpp4 inhibitors and gfp binaries insulin resistance partly with metformin and thiazolidine diets and this new group of mitochondrial uh, modulators that, that that hopefully we will have in a couple of years or a few years that looks at mitochondrial biogenesis ultimately that should reduce the a1c but the blood pressure the cholesterol but importantly the cv risk and and more importantly uh, uh, prevention of progression of the metabolic memory that we have this is again just summarizing uh, summarizing this whole thing and looking at that that what should be probably the role of these agents in the future so to summarize uh, this lysemia is a continuum that exists from insulin resistance to diabetes diabetes and associated complications one of the key factors that get affected in diabetes and its progression is metabolic flexibility the mitochondria play a crucial role in determining the metabolic flexibility especially uh, in the in the respiratory chain electronic transport chain which is 2 3 and 5 this sort of metabolic flexibility or metabolic inflexibility is associated with every step of the uh, continuum of of cardiorenal metabolic disease and metabolic mitochondrial modulators seem to be a new way of looking at addressing the metabolic inflexibility thank you for your patience i'm so happy uh, for this invitation uh, i will join uh, to answer any questions thank you so much